Please again look with me at our passage. Ephesians chapter 6. Our series this morning, we're continuing the series of studies. Titled of the series is Stand Firm in Crisis. How do we as Christians stand firm in a crisis? The world is in crisis. We've been also speaking on the fact that the church has been in crisis because it's departed from the truth of the scriptures. It's looking for life in other places. It's looking for substance in other places, even uh, the, the endeavor of um, a social gospel and, and the social uh, uh, agenda to, 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 to uh, help and aid man and make him feel better about himself. Well, man can't feel better until he's felt worse, much worse. He has to understand his position before an almighty, holy God. He is a sinner and he needs saving. And until we recognize our lost state, we will never find what it is to have life and joy and peace provided by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, the title of our message this morning of this series is Take Up the Whole Armor of God. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, sisters, you're included in, <laughs> in this statement by Paul. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. In the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith which, with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me, that I might open my mouth. Boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We've considered the battle, the threat of this battle. And the threat of this battle to our very life and existence. That is really our eternal life. We can't continue in the pattern of life we once were in. For what does it profit a man? If he would gain the whole world and lose his own soul, Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, Jesus' words, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Generations before us have tried and failed to attain some uh, recompense for all that they have done, equating good works to be enough. I'm not as bad as this person here or that person. Well, I don't do that. So I'm justified in my understanding that God will accept me for what I've done, my attitude, the way I've treated people. No, dear heart, 
The standard is the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us will be measured against him. Every heart will have to say, what have you done with Jesus? For God sent Jesus to die for the sins of mankind. And fragrantly, fragrantly, we have turned our hand and our fist against God and said, we will not have you rule over us. But still, God sent Jesus who died for us. So we're in the midst of a battle that is real. And it's not just after our very uh, rational, real, uh, um, physical life. Our enemy, the devil, Satan, is after that which he wants to destroy, our eternal destiny, where we will be after this life is over. There is a heaven to gain. There is a hell to shun. And the battle is real. Our sustained and sustaining disciplined effort is against an enemy who will not stop his advances. The battle against the enemy is not focused on our vain victory, but rather for the purpose of glorifying the lamb whose life was given as a ransom for my life and for your life. Ephesians 6.13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Take up the whole armor. For us to do that, we must find ourselves strong in the Lord, Ephesians 6.10, which we've already covered. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Our strength is in the Lord who sustains us at all times. Our weakness and our recognition of our weakness affirms our reliance upon the power of his might, not on self-reliance. Verse 11, we can see we are to put on Put on the armor. Verse 13, it reiterates and takes it a step further. We are to take up the armor. Herein, laying at our door is a process for us, a decision. Decision predicates action. Firstly, Decision predicates action. Secondly, preparation defines our choices. We consider it. We think about it. What are we going to do? How are we going to go about this if we're being told to pick up the armor? We have a decision to make. It predicates a need to respond. Preparation defines our choice. We think about what we're going to do with the decisions before us. And thirdly, obedience gives us, hold the finger up. Obedience gives us the commission. A soldier called to enlist is given a commission. He's paid for his work, his service. Obedience to that very instruction to take up the full armor of God is rewarded by that term, enter into the joy of the Lord. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You can remember phrases from the scriptures that remind us of what it will be when our deed and our work is done and we see him, we see Jesus, the one whose life was given as a ransom his life paid for my liberty to be free from sin, free from bondage, free from guilt and shame, free from habitual practices of everything that God hates. Before you can put on the armor, you must take off the world. Now hear what I'm saying, please. We come to Jesus 
We come as we are. We come as sinners. We come, as the hymn writer affirms, a wretch like me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We come in our filthy state before coming to Christ. In that, there is all the evidence that confirms we need Jesus to save us. The tragedy of our lives, the brokenness, the bitterness in bondage to sin, lust and pride are the pleasures of sin for a season but their end is death, it's sure. But now when the brilliant rays of, glorious, of the glory of Christ, the warmth of God's eternal love invade our hearts and minds and flood us, we are set free from everything that was no longer practicing what we were. Fear is replaced with love. Hate is replaced with compassion. Greed is replaced by grace and the heart to restore even fivefold what was taken. For the work of grace reaches and changes our very nature. Friends, if this evidence is not seen in our lives of a change, we've been made new creations. I'm told in Romans chapter 8, therefore, what does it say? Let's read it again. Romans chapter 8. We know it, we can quote it, but look at the words and let the hearing and the seeing remind us this is not something to recite and, 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 and speak as a mantra. The reality must be evidenced in our life. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is, therefore, now... Well, that's a lot of running in words, isn't it? There is, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life is Jesus Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law might be but fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's evidence of the work of grace that Christ died not in vain, but that the glory of himself can be reckoned in and through our lives. There is then this exchange, if you will, which we've covered previously. Fear is replaced with love. Hate is replaced with compassion. Greed is replaced by grace and the heart to restore even fivefold. And the word of God makes this clear to our hearts. Thanks be to God for for his unchanging word that shows us what we look like, what we did look like, and what we look like even now. In fact, the Holy Scriptures shine the eternal light of God's truth that we may see specifically Jesus. It's not directed that what we would see all of our state, yes, that's important, but it's more that we are captivated by the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ himself, what he has done, who he is, the son of the living God. Yes, he came 2,000 years ago, born of a virgin, born under the law to redeem those under the law. 
Yes, it's reported in history. He was a great man, but he's more than a man because he was put to death on the sake and, and the testimony of the, of the priests that he, being a man, made himself to be God. This is the reason they put him to death, the religious order. What are we going to do with Jesus? Is he the son of God? Do we need to respond to him? Or have we done pretty well so far in this life? Used our minds and our intelligence, our abilities, practical endeavors. And what has it got for us? Failure, frustration, hurt, damage, brokenness, disassociation from family, friends. What have we ever done right, really? But when we come to Jesus, he takes what we were, the broken state that we were in, and he gives us a new heart. Instead of being stone, we have a heart of flesh that can respond with life that Christ pours in. Holy Scriptures shine the eternal light of God's truth that we may see Jesus, not just comprehend his humanity, but by revelation, the illuminating of who Jesus is, his power and glory, the what we were as a beggar in rags. We're lifted from what we see around us and we look to Jesus. What does the writer to the Hebrews say? Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, but we see Jesus. who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. This is the purpose and the reason why Jesus came. He was made lower than the angels to the form of a human being for the suffering of death, but now crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death. For everyone. There's no, no, no limitation even to the extent of your sin that would keep you separated from God. Let me tell you this morning, the grace is measured out that meets everything that you have ever done, ever are doing now and ever will do because of the immensity of who he is. The glory of God made manifest in Jesus. Just as an aside, considering the scriptures this morning, there's many words that are used to describe the word of God. One of the preeminent scriptures that talks about the scriptures as truth is in the passage of Psalm 119. Who's read that? It's the longest chapter in the Bible. It takes some working through, but boy, does it bring your focus to the importance and the preeminence and the sufficiency and the glory and the wonder of the word of God, that which God has given his manual for us to know how to live and how to respond to God. It's not left up to us to make a decision about what we're going to do. God has given us the instruction. We are to conform to it. And Psalm 119 so many passages refer to the word. Have a look when you go home. This is your homework. Go and have a little read of Psalm 119, but 119 verse 43. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. 119 verse 142. 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is is truth. Psalm 119, verse 151. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. And here in support of my statement that the scriptures are truth in themselves, verse 160, verse 160 of 119. The entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. How beautiful is that?
fire and a hammer. Please turn Jeremiah chapter 23. Here's another explanation of what the word of God is, the Bible, that which we hold so dear and we reverence. Jeremiah 23 and verse 29. Jeremiah records on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaking of the word of God, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces. That's exactly what it does, friends. It challenges everything that we have built. It cuts across our, our, our whole plan and purpose in life when we are away from God. But when we come to him, he gives us purpose. He gives us identity. It's not my career. And even as a Christian, our, our, our work and endeavors are not where we pull and draw our identity from. Our identity is hid in Christ. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives with me, in me. But purpose to fulfill the commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. The word is truth. The word is fire. The word is a hammer. Ephesians chapter 5. Talking to husbands and wives. And the communion that is to be had in a relationship that is right in God's eyes. And in relationship with him. Forbearance, love. Communion, fellowship with one another in the bonds of marriage. Ephesians 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Verse uh, verse 26. That he might, that is he as in that Christ might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. The word of God is is something that takes away the the stench of sin and certainly cleanses our minds when we imbibe and submit ourselves to the word, continually renewing our mind, changing the habit of our attitudes and dispositions towards life thus far. It washes us, it refreshes us, refreshes us, it restores us. Scriptures are a mirror. Turn with me now to James. James chapter 1. The scriptures are truth. They are a fire. They are water. They are a hammer. Finally, but not exhaustively, they are a mirror. James chapter 1 verse 22. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, Deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Returning to our passage, please. Ephesians 6 verse 13. The evidence of a changed heart is a changed life. The two go hand in hand. 
A changed heart expresses a changed life. The clothes of sin and particularly the clothes that identify with the world must be taken off and must be burned. You can't put on the armour of God if you are still working, working in and wearing the rags of the world. Just consider our passage. The Apostle Paul was in prison. We writes this letter and, and probably three others which are described as the prison epistles. Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, and our passage particularly Ephesians. You know, he's writing at this time to the church in Ephesus where he's watching and observing the whole palace guard sharing the gospel with them, sharing with all the soldiers. This is picked up in Philippians chapter 1, verse 2. The fact that he was witnessing and sharing, he records for us. Luke writes it down and Paul is dictating to, to Luke. Philippians 1, verse 12, but I want, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. He's found himself in prison, bound in stocks, chains at different times, possibly not at this particular time, but he was under house arrest. All of these things have turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Verse 13, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. In whatever state Paul found himself, he shared Christ crucified. He shared what he had done to him, the testimony of his life. He was a Jew. In fact, he was a zealous Jew for the, the, the fullness of the law in keeping everything. In fact, this new sect of Christianity, what did he do? He sided even with those who were putting to death Stephen, who was telling them of the glory of God. And looking unto unto God, he was standing there being stoned by the Jews, Paul there consenting to this act, holding the clothes of those who had taken their garments off so they could get a better reign. But then the Lord Jesus met Paul. Paul was headstrong, wanting to fulfill everything that he had determined in his heart. We've got to destroy this this new religion, this this, this faith, these, these Christians. And the Lord met him on the road and he said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting? And his response, Lord, who are you? Until we actually ask that question of our hearts. The evidence of creation is beyond question. In fact, in our own hearts, when we strip away the the, the layers of false thought and look to the reality that's hidden within our own heart, we have to acknowledge that the Lord God of heaven created all things it's within our heart to do so when we deny that we are suppressing the truth of that the scriptures tell us paul says although they knew him as god they did not glorify him as god nor were they thankful men in their own left of their own schemes hate god they've turned away from him But Paul was arrested on that road to Damascus. And all the things that preceded this particular point, he had borne testimony to Christ over and over again. Jesus saves sinners. And Paul said, I'm the least of all the apostles and I am the chief of sinners. We all can identify with that, can't we? 
In this chapter we have been studying, Paul effectually has summarized. Think, think about this. He's effectually summarized the entire letter of Ephesians in this complete imagery of the soldier and the armor that he puts on. We discovered last week the battle lines are, are, are drawn in chapters 5 and 6. The walk in love in chapter 5. Putting off and putting on in chapter 4. The reason for putting off and putting on is due to the revelation of Jesus found in chapter 3. We can work back all the way through, even to where we are seated together in Christ. That gives us the willingness to take up this armor and the willingness to throw down this life that has clothed us with rags that stench of filth and corruption. Ephesus, where Paul is writing, the, known for its great temple of, of Diana, where every idolatrous and immoral practice was observed. Really, the gratification of the five senses was foremost in their religious observance. But all resulted from the expression of their hearts. So the Christian, by this letter from Paul to the believers in Ephesus, must have a clear separation from the world. Any resemblance to the world was not to be named among the believers. Here is a, the, here, right, right here at this point is a huge dilemma in our Western Christian identity that comes really from our unwillingness to identify completely with Christ but stay identifiable with the culture that we find ourselves in. Dare I say, if through our appearance we can assimilate to the world and I think there's something wrong. Clothing should be the frame and border for our face. Our eyes should be visible so we can see in because they are the windows of the soul. If we identify with the world in our external, it's because there's still some reservation internally. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, but everything is ordered from what we say we are and who we are and how we present ourselves. Consider, who are we identifying with? We've accepted so much. But Ephesians, the, this, this incredible book, addresses these very facts. Ephesians 5, please turn with me, chapter 1. Sorry, chapter 5, verse 1. We don't imitate the world, but what are we instructed by Paul right here? It's clear. Verse 1, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 
And I suggest to you, continue to read that passage this afternoon. If you are hungry after the Lord. If you're not hungry, well, then I'm really wasting your time. In past generations, Christians were outcasts because everything about their life expressed their devotion to the Lord and a separation from the entrapment of sin and its vice. Why have we accommodated the world in our homes, in our lifestyles? Men and women, boys and girls, upon being born again, would so fear and reverence God that the smoking and the drinking would miraculously lose its power and hold. The gaming and the gambling would stop. Every vice was put to death. Language was so altered that it is reported that during the Welsh revival, the teams of pit ponies would no longer obey the driver for he was no longer using profanity and swearing nor having fits of outrage. And they did not know what they were to do, so they stood there. Because the miners' language and disposition was contrary to the way they had been trained. The miners' families in those times of revival prospered because the miners started to bring home their earnings no longer squandered on alcohol and immoral conduct. During the time of the Welsh Revival, a notable evangelist, Stephen Jeffries, with his younger brother, Jeffrey, uh, George Jeffries, they were born again by the Spirit of God in 1904. And in 1907, both were filled with the Holy Spirit. The two young men began preaching on the street they were coal miners, young men, very young men. And two young men began preaching. Soon invitations came to speak at various churches in Wales and throughout England, evidenced by their changed lives because they were just like the rest. But their changed lives ev ev evidenced holiness of life and a power of the message they both spoke and lived. Let me quote an article from the Flower Pentecostal Heritage Center. As it said of Stephen Jeffries, and I read, Jeffries expected his converts to become new creatures in Christ. Many of his hearers Although already church members became convicted of sin and experienced conversion, hearkening back to his career in the coal mines, he would teach the people to sing, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. This song could be heard late into the night as people were encouraged to live a life of total consecration to Christ. The response was not great, was not so great that Jeffries experienced, sorry, the response to this was not so great that Jeffries experienced opposition from both the priests and the pub owners. As he converted the religious and the irreligious to his brand of Pentecostal Christianity. 
the August 25th, 1928 edition of the Pentecostal Evangel reported that the messages were often addressed to religious sinners, church members who had not been born again. One woman who testified of salvation had been an active church member for 50 years before knowing the power of a relationship with Christ. Jeffries encouraged the converts to find a church where the Pentecostal message was preached, exhorting them. And I quote, I don't believe in putting live chickens under a dead hen. If you profess Christ as Lord and Savior and are still identifying with the world, then you are religious and are truly no child of God at all. How can we claim the privilege of a child of God and run with the walls of Satan? How is this possible? How can it be in our day? The churches are filled en masse with people who say one thing but do another. Why are the churches filled with unconverted soul, powerless over sin, searching for someone to affirm their habits and lifestyle and tolerance, the indifference to the claims of the Holy Spirit's work in the life of a man to save him? Why do professing Christians have idols in their homes? Why do we have idols in our homes? Answer me this question. Do all your chairs in your lounge room face the television? Friends, I say these things. Do you think that I haven't been affected by the things that have been laid on my heart this year? Where have our hopes been placed? Where has our faith been placed? I think it's primarily because we have listened to the lukewarm platitudes of a tolerant gospel and have never denied ourselves nor taken up the cross of Christ and determined to take the cross to the ends of the earth. We're not even willing to take them down the street to our homes and to our families. Leonard Ravenhill said, One thing is sure, a man carrying a cross out of the city, you know he is never coming back. Men and women who have never left Egypt, which is a type of the world, never left their past life behind, but put to death the deeds of the flesh. It is though Jesus did not die for sinners. His cross work has no power to save sinners and keep them as saints. That's the evidence. Love for the comforts of the world hold a greater value than following the nail-scarred hands of the Savior. If we are to ever obey the command to put on or to take up the whole armor of God, we first must take off the apparel of the kingdom of darkness. Why? Because the smell of smoke from hell's furnace is still on our clothes. The stench of past experience cannot glorify Christ. Paul writes and continues to Ephesians, telling them about the new life and and the evidence that should be there. You need to read all of Ephesians. You you need to read the scriptures. Just keep reading the scriptures. But we're directed in this, this passage of Ephesians at present because of our text. But please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. You need to read this preceding verses, but for the sake of time. Let 
Maybe we'll read it, verse 20. Ephesians 4, verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This is what I think is not happening. Oh, yes, Lord, forgive me. But the renewing of the mind process, well, that's hard work. That requires us to be discipled. That requires us to respond to our brothers and sisters. That requires us to rightly look into the word of God being the truth, the fire, the hammer, the mirror, the water. If our attire makes us comfortable and accepted in this world, you can guarantee it will not pass muster in glory. Just consider, in closing, the parable that Jesus gave concerning the wedding feast. Found in Matthew chapter 22. And turn there if you like. Jesus begins to express in verse 2 of Matthew chapter 22. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. The typology is that Jesus expressing God the Father has arranged for his son to be united to a bride. And for us, we understand this is the bride of Christ, the church, us. Well, with that imagery in the back of our minds, it goes on to explain that the Father prepares and has everything in order. And he sends messengers to those who are invited guests. You know, the... The, the reference is really to Israel and to Judah. But they were unwilling. God turns to the highways and the byways. He turns to the whosoever. He turns to the Gentiles. And here's a summation of the gospel. The message has been gone out for years, hundreds and thousands of years, but every heart refuses and resists until the revelation of who Christ is comes to an open heart prepared by God to respond to his invitation to the marriage of the Lamb. Reading in verse 8, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king, God the Father, came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called but few are chosen. Friends, the call is to every heart. You will not enter heaven without Christ being placed upon you in exchange for taking off the world. 
we need the righteousness of another. The righteousness of the Son of God, the Lamb that was provided for the sins of the world. Worthy is the Lamb, it says in Revelation 5. Worthy is the Lamb to take the book, the scroll, and open the seals thereof. Only Jesus is able to cleanse you of your sin, to set your heart right, to order your steps, to even have the right attitude in your thinking concerning all things pertaining to life. We submit to the word of God, the renewing of our minds, the revelation of Jesus. So will you take up the armor this morning? Will you lay down the world this morning? You've contemplated coming to Christ. Let me give you some instruction on what you can do this morning. For today is the day of salvation. God calls all men everywhere to repent. Firstly, A, it's as simple as ABC to understand the salvation message, the gift that is on offer provided by our Savior Jesus. Admit you are a sinner is A. Jesus died for sinners. Your acknowledgement that you are lost, that you are a wretch, you are ungodly, you are a sinner demonstrates to God the Father You have been humbled by the law of God. You recognize your lack. And this conviction of sin through the work of the Holy Spirit on your heart, applied to your conscience, now becomes evident to you. The law establishes our guilt before a holy, just, and good God. He is so good. You can't have an unjust God who judges rightly, even in our natural terms. An unjust judge, he's worthless. We expect a judge to uphold truth, to uphold the law, and to rightly divide what the law says clearly. Romans chapter 6, verse 26 reminds us of this fact. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This admission, this confirming in our hearts, this response requires repentance. Repentance towards God because it is him we have wronged. And faith, trust, and obedience in Jesus, that he can save us. Repentance means to change, to change your mind and soul from the attitude and disposition. And it means to change it with the action of turning. You are traveling your own way. Repentance requires you to change your heart and thinking I'm I'm forsaking all this. I'm burning the bridges to it. I'm never going back and I'm going to follow Jesus. And I'm going to live for him. Admit you're a sinner. B, believe Jesus is Lord. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that your profession of your faith and are saved. Admit, believe, call, C, A, B, and C, call. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Romans, same passage, Romans 10, verse 13. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
You must, by cho- you must, by choosing and acting of your own free will, speak to God, the Almighty One, the Creator, the Judge, the Sovereign God of all things, and pray. Prayer is just like you're communicating to your friends, your family, your wife. Prayer is directing that conversation to the God of heaven who wants to come and live and reside in your heart and direct everything that you do. It's as simple as one, two, three, A, B, C. Admit, believe, and call. With contrition, you recognize that you have offended a holy, just, and good God and need to be restored. Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you for the entry of your word into hearts and ears that are opened and prepared by you. May we, Lord, take to heart what you want to do with us and how you want to change us and how we need to be soldiers of the cross, no longer submitted, marching after the world's song of destruction, but, Lord, following the march of eternal life. The King is coming. The King is coming. Oh, Lord, that we would have that in our hearts and our minds, that the day is short and the time is short. And, Lord, we must be about the King's business, the kingdom work, Lord, that you have placed your life in our hearts, that we can live for you. For those, Lord, who are, Lord, dead in their sins, they need to be awakened to their need, and, Lord, they need to respond to the gospel the good news that Jesus saves sinners, that he restores and heals. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon us. Let hearts and sinners find mercy at the foot of the cross where there is life to be had, where there's love to be entered into. As we let go of the burden of this life, of its sin and degradation, And we cleave to Christ. Oh Lord, save us. Free us from those things. Let our lives be so changed. Let us think about how we are living, what we are doing. And Lord, respond to the call that we must take up the armor of God. Oh God, help us. For Jesus' sake, Lord, that through our lives, he may have the preeminence and the glory, for he's worthy. Amen and amen.